Hi friends, welcome. Today I want to look at some of the work of Nathaniel Canella. He is an award-winning commercial and travel film director. And I'm interested in his work because, well, I came across it the other day and I noticed some things about it that were incredibly intriguing to me and made it very distinct. The stuff we're going to look at today, at least, has this interesting focus on a place and the people of that place. Now, often places that are quite exotic to to us Western folk. And it's there's sort of this back and forth that happens as you watch one of these films between the place and the people of that place and the relationship between the two. His films are beautifully shot. They have a an elegant and poetic, but also very organic and raw quality to them. And I love to see when filmmakers find an, uh, interesting ways to create a contrast between those two, a harmony between those two that feels really beautiful. And so I want to look at some of his work today. The first one I want to look at today is called Morocco. And before I get too far into this, one, I will not be sharing the music with you of these films. I would encourage you to check these films out separately yourself and enjoy the full experience, but I will do my best to poetically illustrate what's happening in terms of sound. Also, this is still experimental in the technicalities. I have three different things recording right now, and I noticed in the last video, Instagram started tripping balls, so hopefully this doesn't trip balls in a similar way. Uh, the music here for this one is Moroccan music from the best that I can tell. It has a, a sort of ambient thumping quality to it that moves into driving drum music. And it can be uh, quite violent in its shifting. His films can be quite violent in their shifting, but in such a beautiful way. His ear and his eye for pacing in his edits is one of the things that makes him so special to me. There is also a bed of ambient sounds that you will be experiencing as you're listening or as you're watching and listening to uh, the nature and the city scenes and the shots of people as you move. And, and so you'll have people working. They'll be doing uh, some sort of thing. Maybe they have uh, uh, food in their hand. They're trying to make some food, and you can hear food sounds, whatever that means. And this is one of the things that sets his work apart from other people who try to include ambient sounds, but it feels very disjointed and heavy-handed. His implementation is quite subtle, but if we look at the film, you see uh, a lot of sweeping shots, slow sweeping shots, and all of his shots do this throughout the film. His shots basically never stop sweeping in one direction or another. The whole film does this, and it creates an immersive quality. All of the elements come together to create an immersive quality. You have the, the visual nature, the slow motion nature. Uh, it looks like most of the stuff he shoots is it's got to be in 120 frames or so. The music all comes together to create an immersive, flowing feeling. I love that. We have a shot of a guy hitting, uh, crafting what looks like some sort of pottery, uh, or metal, golden metal pottery. We have a guy throwing some things into a furnace. We have somebody... Uh, was that cooking? There's smoke flying up. Uh, different shots of city life and beautiful colors of Morocco. I, I can tell that there are plenty of colors to be filmed there. You have portraits. He does this interesting thing where he gets portrait shots of people, video portraits, where he's slowly moving away from them or towards them, for example. A lot of filmmakers do this. His execution is really unique of it. We have shots of lightning. And just there, if you're, you were watching, you noticed that there was this crazy energy change that happened. That was probably one of those violent shifts I was talking about. It moves into something that adds a lot more interest to the film, right? You had this slower ambient vibe. And then very quickly, you have a lot of energy come in. And it shakes things up, keeps you immersed in it. It uh, sort of takes you for a loop, and I love that. We have different shots, uh, faster panning shots of we have a guy with a hat and a tassel. He's spinning his tassel, uh, tassel around while he's playing on an instrument. Uh, but we have faster panning shots of uh, kids playing soccer or football, I suppose. Uh, more people with instruments dancing, this sort of thing. You're, you're getting a feeling for the culture of Morocco. And... Uh, everything tends to be in slow motion except for certain shots which 
are intentionally, it's almost like slow motion is the standard for him, and then he speeds it up when necessary. I love that. And now the shots are cutting much quicker. The music is probably driving and thumping. You can hear the drums, and everything's flying around. You're, you're getting more and more immersed into what's going on. The, there was a flipping transition, almost Peter McKinnon-esque. Uh, the, the camera literally flipped over, and then you see a shot of a fountain. And he integrates these interesting transitions, but in a way that's very, once again, subtle, not too heavy-handed. We have a slow-pushing forward shot of this blue water we saw at the beginning. It's crazy blue water, and I'm assuming that is a natural occurrence, maybe accentuated by color grading a bit. But that's it uh, for this one. We're just pushing into the, the blue water at this point. Beautiful. I can imagine the, the feeling of that water would be quite wet. So one thing I love about this film is something that I love about all of his films that I've seen so far, and that is how, subtle, how beautifully paced in such subtle ways the editing is. Nothing. I've seen so many films be made in a way that where, where the editing feels like it was a technique that the person saw somebody use and they used it. It doesn't feel as if there was a, a thoughtful intentionality towards creating something that is an experience as opposed to a collection of techniques put together into something that one would call a film. The difference between truly above and beyond talented filmmakers and those who are newer, less talented, less practiced, is the subtleness of their techniques, the subtleness of the pacing of the edit. And we'll see that, we saw that in this one, we'll see that in the next one as well. And here's the next one I want to look at called Rhythms of Peru. Here we are, we start off with a shot of a llama, which is a good way to start off any short film, I'd say. We have landscape shots. The music for this one is more so a soft and driving stringed instruments. Different in a lot of ways to the last one, but also similar in a lot of ways. It has the quick shifting that you experienced in the last film, but at the same time, it has a more of, uh, of a building and swelling quality to it the music sort of feels more interwoven as opposed to the last one, which had jarring shifts between ambient sounds and drums, for example. So we, have, we start off with shots of landscape. So you start to see a pattern in his style here. We start off with shots of landscapes uh, high up, looks like drone shots moving under a bridge. That's crazy, it's like a crazy ocean bridge thing. Uh, we move into some shots of people and then back to landscapes and then to people and then back to landscapes. More drone shots and then people. It's very interesting and pretty complicated what he's up to here. But as we move into the shots of the people, we get this feeling that we're in a village with uh, a woman who's walking some sheep and sheeps, sheep eye. And there are people walking around, you're, you feel like you're going on a journey with her through the village. And then it shifts from her to shots of people riding horses and riding bikes, different go-abouts, different daily go-abouts. And so this creates a very personal, intimate quality with the people who we're trying to become more connected with in this film. Fascinating, longer lens shine. He uses a lot of different focal lengths and uh, you know, cameras, and it seems to be mid-range to longer focal lengths that he tends to use, but also a little bit of wider stuff as well. And upcoming here, we'll see, whoosh, crazy transition where the sky sort of disappears and then the church building in the foreground disappears. So something that took some time to create, but all of this doesn't feel too heavy-handed because it sort of goes to the service of immersing you into the um, the moment of what's going on it feels like it's intentional it feels like it's thought out but i like to pay attention to what the person's trying to do and what uh, sort of the patterns that they naturally create through their style and if you really study his style you you see some interesting patterns 
you see patterns that are well thought out and you see patterns that are well paced. You see patterns that are cultivated through time, probably. And then we, ha we have these portrait shots, you know, video moving portrait shots of people once again pushing in and out, very close intimate shots of kids' faces. Another one of those crazy transitions of a girl's skirt, she's dancing, dancing with a horse. I don't even know what that's called. Probably some sort of tradition, but it looks like a lot of fun. Uh, glad it's a horse and not some sort of animal that would, would kill her because that could make things really intense and horrible. Looks much more elegant with a horse. <laughs> uh, so she's spinning around, she's dancing, the horse is dancing with her. It's beautiful. And we are moving from these slow motion shots to much quicker shots and then back to slow motion again, just like in the last one. So same idea, patterns. Uh, we move into what looks like could be a different area, or it could be the same area, but different because the people look like they are standing in a different realm than in the last one, which was much more jungly. This one's much more wide open. There's a boat going down a river, more kids playing soccer, another llama, more llamas, please. Uh, and w one thing that's interesting about these sweeping shots that you see are that a lot of times he looks like he's legitimately on a, a transport vehicle. Something's moving him, a boat, a car. He's using a drone and flying sideways. And this really adds a lot of subtle uniqueness to his work. And as you're going through the, the film, you're sort of just grasping what's going on as it's happening and it switches to the next one. It's quite interesting. But... This one's very people-heavy, and I love it. I love all of these dynamic shots. It's actually really hard to get a lot of different dynamic shots. It's very easy to get a shot that is similar to the last one and then get another shot that's similar to that last one. Uh, one thing that is a tell of a really talented filmmaker to me is the dynamicness of the shots when they're working with people. You have a, wi a wider shot, a tighter shot. You have a lot of motion flying around if that's necessary for the film. Then we move into the night scene of Peru and we have people dancing parties we have one of those crazy time lapses where you fly around a building uh, everything's happening really fast it may sound like everything's happening really fast that's because it is but now we're back into daytime again so we went from party life to daytime these high up landscape shots it's amazing that he can interweave all of this together tie a narrative together I think that that is something to study for hours and hours on end. How is he tying these scenes together in a way that doesn't that, that makes sense, doesn't feel disjointed and odd? That's hard to do. It's hard to think non-linearly in the creative world of filmmaking or anything that has to do with a, a timeline. So we see more more shots of uh, the high land. Uh, drone shots of landscapes and then finally we have a shot of a llama looking at the camera knowingly almost like he said yeah you know peru's the greatest country in the world so that was rhythms of peru so what sets the work of nathaniel canella apart for me i'd have to say the llamas that's it <laughs> for one his edits have an epic flowing quality to them and also he uses disconnected disconnected shots, disconnected scenes, disconnected moments, and thoughtfully sections them out in a way that is really remarkable and interesting. The use of slow motion in his films is interesting because everybody uses slow motion. So why is his use of slow motion so powerful? I think it's the pairing between the slow motion and everything else that's happening. The music, the epic quality that he's creating through his edits. And you have to remember that all of this was raw footage. All of this was a, a normal motion shot of somebody standing there smiling and him pulling backwards. And a drone shot. And he pulls all of this together into something that's so beautifully cohesive and, and subtle and thought out. It's so set apart from many other films using footage that's very similar to other filmmakers. And if that doesn't make you feel like you have work to do, it should. <laughs> it definitely should. 
But the use of slow motion in this sense feeds the vision, the story of Morocco or Peru. The fancy transitions in this in the films feeds the vision. All of everything that's happening is funneling in to feeding the vision of telling the story in the way that he has envisioned in his mind. And I think that's powerful. One thing that is amazing is that as I watch his films, and this is how I know I'm really watching something special, I could care less about what gear he's using. Because I care so much about this stout, 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 this Hmm. Let's talk about what just happened there. My computer or my mic or both had an aneurysm, I believe, and it resulted in what sounded like I was dropping a new mixtape. Which is good, because I've been trying to create a new album, and I just haven't had the chance to get into my music editor. I'm working on these videos for you guys. I haven't had the time to get over there and make my music. And this has allowed me to create my intro track. That was it right there, so I'm excited about that. SoundCloud forward slash DeathCloud670611. So where was I at? Gear. And when you're immersed in a story, when you go to see your favorite movie, when you watch the movie in the middle, even if you're a creatively and technically minded, savvy person, you focus on gear all day long, you forget about all of that stuff when you're in the middle of a good movie because you have trusted in the creator of the film that they can take you on an emotional journey. You've allowed yourself to let go of the other parts of your of the things that you care about. You've chosen to fully engage and fully immerse. It's a choice, just as much as it is the filmmaker's choice to create it. With Nathaniel's work, that's what I experience. I don't pay attention to what he's using to create the film. I pay attention to the story he's trying to tell me. With so many YouTube creators, for example, they make films that feel like the film is about them using their cameras and having fun with their gear. And they saw an interesting spot and decided to make a video about it. They went to Iceland, right? There's not this... I can't trust that they have crafted a narrative for me that's really going to take me on a journey. It's going to be something that is remarkable for me. Something that makes me forget about creating for a little bit and just be inspired by what I'm watching. And this is another difference between very talented filmmakers who are really thinking about what they're trying to share with the world and those who are not thinking so much that way. He has a feeling of weightiness to his work, and I love that. And there's a clear definition of story with his films. Everything he does feeds towards the, the end of telling the story of Morocco or Peru. And I would encourage you, you to check out his work and, and dig into it a little bit. If you're a filmmaker, if you're any sort of artist, and think about storytelling. Think about how he tells his story, what makes his storytelling so remarkable to you as it is to me, if it is to you as remarkable as it is to me. We all have different tastes, obviously. But if it is remarkable to you, engage in that and figure out how you can apply that to what you're up to in your own voice. Okay, that's it for this one. I would love to hear your thoughts. Please let me know if there's another artist I can cover that you enjoy. Have a lovely day. Goodbye.